Good afternoon, everyone. We will get started in just a minute or two. Good afternoon. My name is Iris Caldwell. I'm at the University of Illinois Chicago, and we facilitate the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group. I'm very excited to welcome you to today's webinar, uh, where we are focusing on current research um, in the nexus of energy, transportation, and pollinator conservation. And we're considering this uh, research roundtable as an opportunity to bring together researchers and practitioners um, in a space that allows us to apply uh, current research um, and hopefully advance and support collaborative work going forward. This is part of a webinar series. And uh, today we are going to be focusing on monarchs and milkweed. So we're going to be talking about monarch um, monitoring, milkweed establishment on energy and transportation lands, and some of the current research uh, that's helping us understand um, monarch habitat and conservation opportunities, um, particularly on these types of landscapes. I'd like to first uh, welcome and introduce my hosts as well. Um, Joe Drum from Southern Company and Ashley Bennett from Electric Power Research Institute have been helpful in organizing this entire webinar series um, and helping us uh, identify research and presenters on the variety of topics. Um, so Joe and Ashley will be um, helping us throughout the webinar today. Um, and then also want to acknowledge my colleagues, Caroline and Claudia at the University of Illinois Chicago, uh, who are helping with the back end uh, for today's webinar. So as I mentioned, this is part of a webinar series. This is the third webinar in a four part webinar series, again, under the heading of the research roundtable. And our objectives for this webinar um, are really, again, to highlight current research um, that's specifically looking at pollinator conservation and opportunities for advancing and enhancing pollinator conservation on energy and transportation landscapes. And really through those uh, conversations, facilitate further discussion about other related research that's happening in this space, where there may be research needs, um, and hopefully spark some additional conversations around uh, collaborative work um, that we can focus on going forward. So that's again the intent of today's webinar. Very happy and excited to have you all here. This will be a very interactive uh, two hours. So the uh, first portion of the presentation uh, will be uh, presentation format and then we'll be moving into our discussions. Um, but to give those additional details and some of the other items uh, that we need to know today, I'm gonna turn things over to Joe uh, from Southern Company uh, to lead us through those, those tips. Thank you, Iris. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you're on the West Coast. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Again, I'm Joe Drum with um, Southern Company's Natural Resources team. Look forward to the discussion today. A couple of housekeeping items. Um, please keep yourself muted and, and your video off, except 
during the breakout sessions, of course, um, we look for full participation there. Um, this will help with some of our bandwidth challenges that we've all come to know during during this time working at home. If you're still working at home, please um, take a minute or two now um, and click on the three dots next to your name, if you would, and update your your Zoom name with uh, with your organization, so we know who everyone is with. Um, if you have any technical issues or or any 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 questions, please chat Claudia via the chat box, and and she will um, be happy to help you. And please submit all other questions and comments. Understand some some questions might arise during our great presentations today in the chat box, and we'll do our best to to get to those. And lastly, um, you might notice we are recording the presentations and do intend to, to share this afterwards. So today's agenda, the first half of, of the, the webinar today will be focused on our four research presentations. Really excited to listen to our speakers with the second half, as indicated prior, um, for our breakout sessions, which will uh, we hope will facilitate robust um, discussion that uh, will lead to some future research ideas following those breakout sessions we will get back together as a large group and, and recap some of the some of the ideas um, and discussion points we had so i'd like to introduce our, our speakers today um, first dr chris gave with the arizona department of transportation haley nelson with arizona game and fish department dr anu sharma with iowa state university and Dr. Tyler Flockhart, University of Maryland, and Brent Sloan with Life Scale Anal Anal Analytics. Analytics. Yeah, I can't talk. Thank you. So let's start with uh, Dr. Tyler Flockhart. Um, he will be talking today with us about developing, developing optimal roadside management strategies for, of course, monarch butterflies. And with that, hand, hand it over to you, Tyler. Can can everybody hear me now? We can hear you just fine. Thank you. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, thank you everybody for uh, being here and for the invitation to present. So I'm going to talk a little bit about an experiment that we've been running over the last few years as part of a larger research program. Um, and, and this experiment has to do with roadside management uh, and really plays into the right of way um, uh, ideas uh, for conservation of monarchs and, and pollinators. Um, uh, this is in collaboration with my colleague Ryan Norris, who's at the University of Guelph, which is in Ontario. Uh, and of course, I am based as an adjunct faculty out of uh, the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Sciences. And I first need to acknowledge that this is a, a team uh, effort with a whole host of people that are amazing uh, field technicians, uh, managers, uh, and people that can navigate permitting and working with um, utility operators and things like that. And funding from the Ministry of Transportation Ontario uh, as well as the Libra Aero Fellowship. So first I wanna talk a little bit about sort of the big, the big picture of what our research is aiming at, and that's making optimal decisions for monarchs um, across space and time. And primarily we are thinking about uh, rights of way as so, sort of a central nexus of, of understanding conservation and promoting monarch recovery. And this system sort of feeds into a loop where at the top, we sort of have the biological aspects of monarchs. So what are the habitats that monarchs want? What do they prefer and what do they choose given the availability of habitats uh, on the landscape? Once we know sort of what monarchs want and what they choose, we can have a better understanding of how the populations will respond uh, to changes both within the, the habitats themselves, but also through conservation actions. And really, we, we'd like to know the limits of the population as well, because if the population is limited, it sort of influences how likely that population is to, to grow over time. And then that, of course, feeds into what can we do? And this has to do with cost and feasibility. And I think that quite a few people on the, on the call today will sort of fit into this group in terms of what, what can we do uh, to actually promote monarch conservation, whereas I sort of fit into these two buckets up here. 
Uh, and of course, we're talking about things that range from sort of plant level all the way down to what are the milkweed characteristics that monarchs are choosing all the way up to landscape and large geographic ranges. So up at the top, we have data collection and field and laboratory experiments. We have modeling in the middle and down here, we sort of have cost benefits, uh, environmental engineering, things like that. And today I'm gonna to talk about the experiment which falls into this, this top one. So this is a paper that was published in 2019. Uh, it's entitled Strategic Mowing of Roadside Milkweeds Increases Monarch Butterfly Overposition or Egg Laying. And this uh, experiment takes place uh, in Southern Ontario where the box is here near, near the town of Sarnia which is right on the border with Michigan um, and not too far from Detroit. Detroit is right here. And within Sarnia, uh, we have this major sort of roadway that goes around the city. So this is um, sort of a two lane highway that's used by uh, transport vehicles, particularly as they move towards um, uh, southern Ontario, as well as the border with Michigan. And within this uh, stretch of road, this square down at the bottom is where we do primary, most of the, the primary research. And this is what it sort of looks like from an aerial view. Uh, in terms of setting up our different plots here and what they look like on the ground. So this research has sort of two components. One is looking at uh, the effectiveness of seeds and seedlings on, um, on survival and growth. So this is establishing milkweed. And these plots down here, the green ones, have to do with uh, looking at mowing regimes and the uh, success of monarchs in using those habitats. And we have small, medium, and large uh, plots, and that just has to do with the density of milkweeds uh, on the landscape. Previous research suggests that females are selecting areas that have sparse milkweed um, sizes. So in that case, if each one of these plots has, let's say 50 milkweed plants, these large mowing plots would have the lowest density because you'd have uh, 50 plants within a large area compared to 50 plants within a small area. So again, this already establishes that there's these patterns um, of monarchs choosing certain locations on the landscape. But of course, this represents a trade-off when it comes to the number of milkweed that we can actually have on the landscape and whether it should be very dense on the landscape or very sparse on the landscape. Now, within each one of these plots uh, with the mowing regime, what we do is we will establish the plot around existing milkweed plants, and then we will mow at a certain interval uh, the milkweed plants that are there. And basically what happens is you have these sort of uh, established monarchs or sorry, established milkweed uh, that are growing sort of naturally without any sort of intervention, any sort of mowing. And then on this side, depending on when the milkweed is mowed, it will start to regrow. And the reason why this is important is because monarchs, uh, females will actually select these regrowing, these regrowing milkweed preferentially over these established milkweed. And it probably has to do with uh, some of the toxicity of the plants uh, and some of the palatability of the plants for the caterpillars themselves. So again, this sort of establishes that this pattern is seen uh, in nature. And if we're going to be managing roadsides, including mowing, there may be an opportune time to mow that corresponds with how tall the plants are as they grow, their nutritional status, uh, and which of those plants the monarchs are likely to use based on when monarchs arrive in those, in those habitats. So here's just an overview of what uh, the roadside that we worked on looks like. I mean, this is quite typical. We have, you can see here, these are the milkweed plants that are sort of established throughout uh, uh, these areas. And I think that for the most part, here's some milkweed over here. You know, this is quite common of the roadsides that we see in Southern Ontario. Milkweed can actually be quite abundant uh, in, these, in these landscapes. Um, but they are managed quite extensively, as most of you probably understand, uh, for both aesthetics and for safety reasons and for other management objectives. So here's an overview of what uh, the data that we collected sort of looks like. So on the left hand side, this is when we surveyed um, the milkweed and we went out and we counted eggs and caterpillars. And these are the number of eggs, we're just considering eggs right now, uh, per plant. So again, we have uh, we want to know how many eggs we're likely to get per plant, and then we can evaluate how many plants we may or may not have on the landscape and what the corresponding output of the total number of eggs will be. So as we can see in Southern Ontario, as we move from July to September, there's definitely this sort of bump in the middle in terms of the number of eggs on plants. 
Now this has to do more with the arrival of monarch butterflies in Southern Ontario and when they actually lay the majority of their eggs. And the majority of their eggs sort of come in this, this late uh, week in, in July and into sort of mid-August. So this is sort of prime time for us is right in here. But the question is, if they're going to be selecting shorter milkweed or younger milkweed, uh, how does that correspond with when, with when those milkweed may be disturbed? So along the bottom on this plot, we can see this is the weeks since the plot was mowed, ranging from one week all the way to nine weeks. So this, these would be sort of young plants and these would be older plants. And we can see that there's definitely a negative relationship here. There may be sort of a, a little bump like this. And that may be because monarchs won't select very short milkweed that basically haven't recovered yet from being mowed, but they may be selecting plants sort of in this window here as sort of the prime time to, to, lay, to lay eggs. So there may be sort of a, a relationship here that suggests that you know one to two to three weeks after mowing seems to be prime. Now, if we take that and we actually model these data and we look at uh, the date uh, along the bottom here, and then we look at the mowing treatment. So this is when the different plots were mowed. We can see again that there's this, this sort of um, humped shape of the, of the data. And we can see that the highest number of eggs per plant sort of corresponds with these two colors right in here. And those correspond with uh, the first and second week of July. So that is mowing the first or the second week of July ultimately results in the largest number of eggs per milkweed plant uh, that we observe. So this suggests that the optimal time to mow, at least in the study area where, where we conducted this experiment, seems to be sort of the first or second week of July. Now, an important thing that I wanna point out to you is that these lines here, these solid lines correspond to, to 2017. The dashed line is 2016, and you can't even see them because they're way down here. 2016 was an absolutely dismal year for monarchs uh, in Southern Ontario. And we basically had very, very few observations. So I think that there's a couple of take homes from this figure. The first is that we can sort of establish what the best time to mow would be that sort of maximizes the number of eggs. And for us, that's the first or second week of July. And the second is we have a little bit of insight into the variation between years where we have very dismal years and very good years or more average years, I would say. And this type of variation I think is, is really necessary when it comes to designing these optimal conservation strategies because it allows us to sort of forecast if we um, mow at certain times in certain years, we're most likely to maximize monarch uh, reproductive output and that is likely to help recover the population. Whereas in certain years, it may be advantageous not to mow. And these years might actually be years where we have um, recovery of milkweed populations because as you mow milkweed and they have to regrow, they actually cannot reproduce. There's not enough growing season, in, at least in Southern Ontario, for them to produce flowers and to produce seeds that they then release. So on the one hand, you're cutting off the reproduction of the milkweeds while promoting monarchs. So the question is, can you do that in every year? Or are there years when you actually need milkweeds to reproduce and to, to set seed so that those populations can again uh, recover and, and exist in perpetuity? So that's uh, my presentation. I'm hoping that I, I would love to discuss this further with people um, and talk a little bit more about sort of what the next steps are, at, at least for the research. Um, we have sort of multiple programs that are ongoing and now we're at the point where we're sitting on a large amount of data and we really need to start working on analyses, including some of the landscape modeling and some of the mathematical modeling when it comes to uh, understand these trade-offs between management and monarchs. But I will note that all the work that we've done has been in Southern Ontario. And of course, Southern Ontario uh, is at the Northern end of the monarch distribution, at least in the East. Um, and there's lots of areas in the United States where you know, replicating these types of experiments, I think would be inherently valuable because there's going to be areas uh, in the United States where you may be able to mow more than once. You may have areas where you can produce more than one generation of monarchs, whereas in Ontario, most of the reproduction happens during one um, generation sort of in this area. And so we end up with trade-offs, right? In terms of what the optimal strategy is, depending on your latitude, your micro microclimate and the potential um, activities, actions that can be taken. So thank you very much. Um, if there's a minute or two, I can answer these questions. Yeah, go ahead, um, Tyler, you can respond to the 
uh, the couple of questions while I advance the slides to the next speaker. Sure, sounds great. So um, the first question is, how consistent are the dates that monarchs arrive or have the highest numbers been present year to year? That's a great question. So in terms of at Southern Ontario, the arrival uh, timing seems to be somewhat consistent. Uh, we get a few monarchs that trickle in in June and then sort of the first week of July, that's when things start showing up. So the timing is consistent. The variation between the number of monarchs is highly variable. As, I, as you saw in those data, 2016, there was nothing. We saw hardly any monarchs at all. Whereas in 2017, I would classify that as sort of a normal year. And these variations, because we're talking about insect populations, are completely natural, right? And maybe um, not happening on the, on the scale of understanding conservation. This is just what insects do over time. Some years we have tons of mosquitoes and some years we have very few. So these are sort of the natural and biological um, realities that we need to consider when we're talking about insect populations. The second question is, how do, you, how do these dates line up with the current vegetation BMPs, best management practices? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, and actually working with the Ministry of Transportation, we had uh, a little bit of trouble getting that information from them in terms of when the mowing actually happens. And so we got to the point where we just said, well, we're going to sort of establish these dates and at least it gives us a window as to when the prime time would be. There's a whole bunch of logistics, of course, with trying to mow at specific times in specific places. And of course, the mathematical modeling that we would do would incorporate those sort of uh, logistical issues in terms of you can't have 50,000 mowers out over one weekend, right? You need to sort of spread that out. But if you're talking about, let's say, a, a geographic gradient, sort of north to south, maybe that you start at the south and you work your way north. That may be more advantageous than, than something else. And then the last quick question is, do the monarchs have enough time to fully develop before a mowing in July? So at least in southern Ontario, the monarchs show up at the beginning of July. Uh, and it seems that that's when the best mowing uh, time would be. So if we can mow the landscape and then uh, monarchs will lay eggs, they can develop uh, into August and pupate in August, which is sort of the normal timing uh, of when they are uh, eclosing anyways. And so really what we're talking about is if those areas are mowed, there's going to be um, an additive effect of the population because we're likely to have more eggs being laid and ultimately more monarchs. Now, one thing that I, I didn't mention is that there is an, a trade-off between mowing uh, and leaving areas undisturbed, right? Of course, if you put mowers in there, you're likely to kill all the eggs and all the caterpillars that are there. So again, this is one of these trade-offs that we need to consider because mowing and the benefits of mowing certainly need to outweigh those detrimental impacts on the population. But if you can calculate that equation and know where that tipping point is so that you actually produce more monarchs, given how many you kill, then we're talking about population recovery. Thanks. Thank you, Tyler. Great presentation. Thanks for answering the questions. Thanks for asking the questions in the chat. Up next, our, our second presentation for the day will be Dr. Chris Gade and Haley Nelson presenting on planning for monarch butterfly conservation on roadsides and the development of a statewide milkweed species distribution model for Arizona. I'll turn it over to you both. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so again, I'm Chris Gade. I'm part of the um, environmental planning at the Arizona Department of Transportation. Uh, I work mainly on biological resources and also coordination across the various groups working on vegetation management. Um, oops, I didn't have my camera on. Um, uh, among the different groups working on vegetation management within the agency. And I've also been part of the advisory committee for development of the Monarch Candidate Conservation Agreement with insurances. So today I'm going to talk about the reasons that ADOT wanted to develop a milkweed suitability model. And then Haley Nelson from the Arizona Game and Fish Department will discuss the model in more detail. So ADOT is preparing to apply to the Monarch CCAA. And um, for the application, we need to determine how much habitat is present within the land we manage and um, the areas where we should start with focusing our conservation actions. So our initial estimate is that we manage about 200,000 acres within our rights of way and other parcels. And about half of those are vegetated. And so this graphic here shows the types of areas where we expect um, the best opportunities are for 
monarch habitat to exist or to be enhanced. Um, but we didn't really have a good idea of which areas within the state are the most important for conservation action. So I'll give a little more background just on Arizona in general. Um, we have a really large range in elevation across the state. So that means we have a lot of different biotic communities. And this map here shows the ADOT is divided into seven districts that manage the yes. parts of the state. <laughs> And um, the colors wow. represent different biozones bio zones that we use when we're scheduling vegetation management activities. So um, the colors on the map correspond to these different biotic communities. And so you can see the south and the west of the state um, have these lower elevation desert and grassland communities with some also higher elevation sky islands in the southeast. And then the north and east have a mix of higher elevation desert and forested areas. And so as a result, um, Arizona has pretty high biodiversity and we actually have around 29 species of milkweed across the state. Um, so in order to help with planning our monarch conservation efforts, we wanted to understand more about um, where nectar resources and milkweeds might be found or could grow in our right of way. And so the map on this slide shows um, it's from the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper, and it shows reports of milkweeds and monarchs across the state. And there's also a corresponding model of milkweed and monarch habitat suitability that was developed um, for several Western states as part of this effort. And so now um, ADOT and the Arizona Game and Fish Department are collaborating on a model of suitable habitat for milkweed that's similar to this model that the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper ran for multiple states. But we wanted to run the model at a finer spatial scale since we're interested in looking at this and how it applies to our much narrower uh, linear rights of way. And then we also wanted to see if some additional species of milkweed found in Arizona could be included. And so there's also an additional benefit that um, with this collaboration between ADOT and Game and Fish um, that we're developing a statewide model that we're then extrapolating to the ADOT rights of way. And so that statewide model then becomes available. Um, so the way ADOT's gonna use the model is to help um, identify habitat areas we're going to conserve. Um, the areas that are not habitat, which Haley will talk about a little bit more, and then help us prioritize also areas to look at for enhancing habitat. And so with that, I'm gonna hand off to Haley to explain a little more about the model itself. Haley, Sorry, I was, okay, there you I go. was having issues. Yeah, there we go. Um, I lost control of the screen though. So, all right. So for this initial run of the model, we included seven species of milkweed that occur in Arizona, and those species are antelope horns, broadleaf, pine needle, Mojave milkweed, rush, horsetail, and butterfly milkweed. And we selected these seven species both based on their use as larval hosts by monarchs and then also by occurrence data availability. Uh, we received feedback on the species we selected from the AZ Monarch Collaborative, and then as well from the Western Monarch Working Group. So for our model, we chose to use Maxent, which is a machine learning algorithm that uses presence only data and environmental covariates to predict species distribution and habitat suitability. And because this model runs with presence only data, we were able to download milkweed occurrence data sets from the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper 
and from Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And these data sets include many different sources of data, such as iNaturalist, SciNet, herbarium records, et cetera. And from here, we removed any duplicate records that existed between both of these data sets and then cleaned the data temporally and spatially to a 90 meter resolution. So here is the current run of the statewide model for the likelihood of presence of those seven species of milkweed. And on this map, those uh, occurrence points are visible over top of the model. And then here's a view of the model without those points overlaid. Um, we did want to include other species in this model, such as Arizona and desert milkweed, but there just wasn't enough data, data available at the time. So another step that we took was calculating the area of each suitability level for the statewide model, where we found that almost half of the state falls within that combined high and medium suitability range. And then here is the statewide model again with the ADOT highway system as an overlay. And as Chris mentioned earlier, we wanted to come up with a different way to display suitability along the highway system. And so following in the footsteps of Caltrans, we averaged the model values along a linear reference system to display the suitability along the right of way. And so here is a side-by-side -side view of a portion of the statewide model and this, and then the polyline model from the previous slide. And this is for one of the ADOT maintenance districts. And we are currently developing maps for each of the seven maintenance districts like this, and then uh, also calculating the acreage of each suitability type within the legal right of way for each district. And then we're also working on refining species specific models that will also be utilized by the maintenance districts. Uh, all right, so on the left here, we have a table with acreage calculations for the entire legal right of way system. Uh, we also have this information broken out to each of the seven districts as well. And you can see in the table that we have a new suitability type, which is no suitability. And so on the left, you can see that we have the model clipped to the legal right of way. And then we were able to remove areas of no suitability, which include the driving lanes, the paved shoulders, the paved medians, et cetera, um, any paved crossovers you can see um, in those screenshots what I'm talking about. And so that allowed us to capture those areas of, of no suitability. So our next steps include validating the model. We want to ground truth the model within all the suitability ranges to assess its prediction ability. Uh, we also want to continue to update this model as, a dis as additional occurrence data becomes available. And then lastly, we would like to include additional milkweed species in future um, accent runs, again, as more occurrence data becomes available to us. And here are our citations, and that's it for us. If any, if we have time for questions, I don't. Oh. All right. Thank you both. Did I miss any questions in the chat? Let me see here. All right, let's thank you both for highlighting this uh, this research. Let's go on to the third presentation of the day. Uh, Dr. Anu Sharma will present on milkweed plant detection using mobile 
cameras. I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Sharma. Can you hear me? Um, yes, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry, there, there was something going on with uh, my controller. Uh, I don't know if I can turn on my camera or not, but uh, I think I can continue like this. Um, I'll be talking about the milk week detection using mobile cameras. Uh, we did this as a proof of concept study, whether uh, a camera mounted on a vehicle driving on a uh, roadway can be used to do a survey of uh, milkweed plants uh, on the roadside specifically. Um, so, okay. Uh, so the, there were two specific models which we wanted to explore. One was a, a, a compute light model, which uh, basically can effectively be implemented on an onboard machine on the device on the on the vehicle itself and then there would be a heavier compute model if you wanted to collect all the imagery data and then take it to the cloud and uh, essentially uh, do the processing over over there uh, the this is this just shows the setup of uh, how the camera was mounted as i said this was more of a proof of concept study uh, we had a FLIR camera with uh, pretty good resolution so that we can see uh, up to a far distance. And then uh, we were collecting, uh, in each, uh, for this camera, we were just collecting at three frames, frames per second. Um, and and uh, in, in this scenario, uh, we were uh, traveling at a low speed. Mm, we, uh, and I, I, it would be possible to drive, drive faster and, and take a high frame rate, but, uh, essentially to to showcase how the technology can be used we, we just ended up uh doing uh doing it in the, this way uh, for training our models uh we had to manually annotate some of the images uh, we uh, did a combination of things for for uh, getting these images we actually uh, searched online and downloaded milkweed images. We also recorded some images uh, in the areas where we knew milkweed was present and uh, had a human annotate the image. Um, around uh, 2,700 images were annotated. Uh, a, a, a lot more images would have been better, but uh, in, in this scenario, we, we began with, with a smaller data set uh, to see how good the training can be. And as I, as I said, some of these images were, were part of a, a data collection, which was done by the camera mounted on the car and the rest of them were just uh, some images taken uh, from online and some images collected by other researchers in, in our group. So uh, after we uh, got the images, we the first approach, as I said, uh, we use the aggregated channel mo feature model, which, which basically uh, is not a deep model. Specifically, it takes all the channels uh, of the image and vectorizes it. And then it just uses decision tree boosting to find out which uh, pixels uh, are important. And it is just a supervised training algorithm. The good thing about this uh, algorithm is that you don't need specialized computing for, for training and uh, inferencing on this model. And that's why it can be. Uh, be very widely deployed and, and uh, also um, can process a lot of data. So uh, as, as you can see, after we trained our model, then we uh, started testing it on different imagery obtained from uh, either online or from our, uh, uh, from our uh, vehicle. Uh, the, we were able to see that uh, it, it was, uh, producing a decent decent amount of results. Uh, the, the higher confidence when, when reported requires a higher confidence of the model itself in detecting those 
uh, uh, those trees. Um, for the training data set, we had around uh, 78 uh, percent accuracy in, uh, in, in the detection. Uh, in the test data set, it was not that high, but again, I, I think it is, um, it is a, a lot is dependent on how much, how much training samples you have to begin with. The other model which we used for, um, for inferencing and uh, doing the testing was ResNet50. Uh, we used the pre-trained model and, and then just, um, uh, just uh, transferred the weight, weights of the fully connected layer to, for, uh, as a transfer learning mechanism. And uh, a ResNet50 uh, is essentially a heavier model. It is a deep, deep learning model. It used the data which we had uh, collected with human training uh, and uh, for, for training it and, and uh, producing results. So uh, in terms of ResNet, again, you can see that it, can, it, it is able to detect mid milkweed under dif different um, conditions when it is surrounded by other species as well as well as a different lighting condition. Uh, in, in this case, again, the higher value of uh, uh, detection, which is uh, written in the box, uh, uh, shows uh, that uh, the algorithm has a higher confidence. Uh, this uh, did significantly better in both training and testing, ResNet50. But as I said, the, the trade-off is between uh, whether you want to process the data offline or you want to do it on, on, on the vehicle itself. So uh, kind of to, to kind of do a real world test, we did uh, take this uh, vehicle and drove to some of the areas where the milkweed was actually surveyed uh, on, on few locations. And, uh, and it, it sometimes uh, as this is, yes, detecting for only common milkweed right now. So that, that was the first uh, test we did. We, we didn't train it for different species. species. Um, the, as you can see, even for humans, that can be sometimes difficult, but uh, the algorithm does pick some of those things. And I'll talk about some of the issues which we were seeing in terms of milkweed detection. Uh, so uh, in, on the top left corner, you see that there are multiple weak milkweed plant present, but there were few that were picked up and not all of them were picked up. Uh, in the in in the bottom uh, left, you can see that uh, there is a cluster of milkweed plant that was detected as one milkweed plant, and there are also false detection happening. Especially, uh, uh, I, I think the data which we had uh, collected had more green milkweed and not uh, a lot of uh, uh, the one towards the end. So we we thought that it might be good to have. Um, it would be good to have uh, the different seasons and, and collect the photos over there. And uh, obviously there were some false detections with other species too. We, uh, as I said, we did a we also compared the estimated milkweed presence to the actual milkweed locations where uh, there, there were, uh, in terms of uh, probability of uh, counts and things like that, we were seeing that there was some correlation, uh, but um, some of the things to keep in mind is that uh, when you are driving next to the road, you are not, if there is a, uh, if there is a hill or something, uh, th there can be a, a just line of sight obstruction in that scenario, I think it might be better to look at uh, doing a drone-based survey. The uh, similar techniques can be used for camera uh, image classification on drones. Uh, but we, we did uh, see that when we were ranking the number of milkweed which we saw from the camera-based survey compared from site to site, we had some, some correlation there. Um, this, this just kind of shows uh, the video uh, you will see that in some of the cases. Um, so for example, here you are detecting some of the milkweed when the red box is showing up. Um, so uh, it just in, in general shows how uh, like difficult some of the classification was, but it was, it was definitely picking up uh, uh, a very obvious uh, location of milkweed. But in some cases we were also seeing that they, it, it was missing out because the vegetation closer to the road might be uh, a little bit more dense. 
So at, at, at the end of the presentation, uh, the things for future work is obviously more data for training, uh, get more stages of milkweed. Uh, maybe some of the stages of milkweed, it is easier to detect the milkweed density compared to the other stages that that thing has to be done. Um, and also uh, we would like to do uh, a, a faster frame rate study where we are uh, here, we were just uh, collecting the data at, uh, three frames per second, uh, we can try a faster frame rate and see if we detect more. And then finally uh, doing it using uh, drones and things like that, where you can cover more area and it, it is not blocked by uh, something which is just close to the uh, close to the roadway. So with that, I'll uh, open up the floor for any questions and uh, uh, we can uh, we can have more discussion in the in, in our session. Uh, group session as well. Any any questions? Dr. Sharma, I look like there was one in the in the chat. Ashley Bennett with Epley yeah. asked if you go ahead, Ashley. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, my question was uh, looking at your images. A lot of them look like they were in the fall, and yeah. I think you kind of hit on this in your next steps. And I was wondering if testing your camera and your model at different times of year when the milkweed is in different stages of that might help improve the accuracy of the model. And based on our experience, I think it would. And we, it, uh, especially if uh, there are stages in milkweed where uh, it it is distinct uh, distinct. Uh, it has more distinct features if uh, sometimes when, when there are flowers, it might have a very distinct flower and that might be beneficial. We haven't tested all those scenarios out, but I, I think there, there would be a difference. Okay, thanks. That's, that's what I was wondering. Thank you. And uh, this, this paper has also been published in Ecosphere. So if someone wants to uh, go and take a look at the paper as well, uh, it is uh, referenced in at the start of my slide deck too. So uh, you can go out and uh, take a look, check it out. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharma. Great presentation. So our fourth formal presentation of the day before we head to our breakout sessions. Um, is, get, is going to be given by Brent Sloan. He's going to discuss exploring the, exploring the use of UAVs and satellite imagery to identify, again, milkweed. Brent? Thank you, Joe. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending. Uh, that's uh, In this case, it's not really good to go last all, after all those great presentations. But uh, anyways, uh, Thanks, thanks for attending. So today I'm gonna to be presenting a project that we did with EPRI <clears throat> last summer in Boulder County, Colorado. Um, the overarching goal of this project was to see if we could uh, successfully develop an algorithm to detect uh, milkweed and other important pollinator species using um, UAV and satellite imagery. So uh, given the focus of this group, they'll only be presenting results for milkweed and then discussing some next steps about um, our future research. So what is the connection between utility right-of-ways and pollinators? Um, many utilities practice integrated vegetation management, um, which we know reduces undesirable species. It increases native species, promotes a healthy ecosystem, um, you know, lowers operation and maintenance, and uh, the list goes on. And we all know that biodiversity is a key to a healthy ecosystem. Um, a good IVM plan that involves pollinators play a key role in supporting biodiversity. Uh, key pollinator species such as milkweed help to support biodiversity, which can promote um, you know, ecosystem productivity. It can promote soil formation and protection as well as um, provide um, nutrient storage and recycling along with many other added benefits. A goal of our research was to improve the monitoring of quality pollinator habitat. Um, if we could accurately identify these species using remote sensing technology, uh, we can improve um, on targeted management, which will help with increasing um, habitat quality and protect existing habitat. Um, additionally, managing for quality pollinator habitat helps in um, land and species protection. 
This type of initiative can support the monarch butterfly and other pollinators through the candidate conservation agreement with uh, assurance for energy and transportation lands. Okay, so, um, so we've reviewed a little bit about IVM within utility corridors and how managing for pollinators is beneficial on many levels. So let's take a little bit, uh, let's take a review on, on what our study objectives were. So the first goal was to, to determine if UAV imagery could be used to identify pollinator habitat. Uh, next, it was to develop an algorithm to detect um, target flowering species such as milkweed. And then based on our findings, the goal was to provide guidance um, for UAV monitoring on utility lands. Um, for our methods, ESRI partnered, I'm sorry, EPRI partnered with uh, my geospatial solutions group at LifeScale Analytics. And um, what we did is we were, we conducted six UAV flights in Boulder County, Colorado, where we knew um, there was a lot of good quality pollinator habitat. Um, when we flew each of these study areas, we would also collect field data with mobile devices, um, high accuracy GPS uh, connected via Bluetooth to identify locations of very, um, various pollinator species and uh, other land cover types. So um, after the data collection occurred, we began our modeling process. And um, this is, you know, most of the folks on here that love to model, this is a cyclical process that starts with data collection. Uh, then we train our model. Next, we generate the classification layers, then we validate the results. And we continue this process over and over until we actually get the results that we're looking for. Um, and there's a little bit of a lag with the switching here. So um, our target plants were showy milkweed, Mexican hat, blanket flower, um, prickly pear cactus. And um, these are perennial species that are all native of Colorado that bloom in the summer and are attractive to pollinators. And that was probably stemming the question that Ashley uh, had just asked about different times of the year. So um, we wanted to catch these, um, you know, these species while they're actually in, uh, in full bloom. So after, I went too fast there. So after each of the study locations, we'd record the GPS locations with photographs identifying the targeted species um, which were used to train the models and uh, to verify the model accuracy. So we conducted um, these six flights using a Mavic Pro 2 with a Centera double edge, I'm sorry, double 4K red edge sensor. Um, our average altitude was 50 meters and we had a five band um, spectral resolution from uh, uh, red, green, blue to near infrared and red edge and we had a 1.5 centimeter spatial accuracy. And with our model development, um, one thing I wanted to point out here was that um, we actually ended up separating out the milkweed flower heads from the foliage uh, of the flowers to improve model accuracy. When we first ran it, we developed polygon boundaries around um, the individual plants. And uh, what we found was that the spectral range um, was a little too diverse and uh, the accuracy wasn't as good as we liked. But once we ended up separating out the, um, the milkweed flower heads, uh, we, we got um, much better accuracy from that. So, um, so after we did that, we actually got up to 90% accuracy across the five study areas. Um, the image on the left is just basically representing the true um, RGB UAV imagery. And then the imagery on the right is showing the classification results. So what you're seeing there, um, the areas in, that are white, uh, almost like a pinkish color, uh, represents the showy milkweed. Um, so uh, we got really good results. So the, the results from the satellite imagery um, didn't perform as well. Uh, we calculated the highest accuracy we were able to get was 74% uh, across the three study areas um, for showing milkweed, which is 21% less accurate compared to, uh, to the UAV analysis. So we, <clears throat> in conclusion, we were able to accurately, accurately identify milkweed from UAV and um, the results from satellite were less accurate. Um, I don't know what happened to the, I guess somebody took over there. But um, so we, we kind of expected that um, 
um, you know, those results were going to happen. Um, I don't know what happened. My last slide isn't showing. I was still progressing there. But in any case, um, we know that technology will continue to improve. Um, our goal with this was really to bridge the gap between UAV and satellite imagery and um, ultimately to produce a scalable model for identifying quality habitat from satellite. Um, we know it's going to take a little time, but um, again, technology is progressing pretty quickly. And I did want to point out that we are currently testing our model on two different um, milkweed species. We're looking at common and um, butterfly uh, milkweed in the Midwest. So stay tuned for future results. And um, thanks for tuning in. Feel free to ask any questions. I'll uh, take a look here. So um, the first question was, are you assigning specific wavelengths and bandwidths for milkweed? Um, are you using, what are you using to differentiate milkweed from other species? So um, yes, we are, we are pulling specific wavelengths um, across the different bands um, to identify the actual um, showy milkweed. And showy milkweed was the only milkweed species that we actually used for um, for this particular study. That's why this year we wanted to test on, on some different species. Um, as far as identifying from milkweed and other species, um, in any sort of classification model like this, you want to collect other land cover types that, um, that are within the study areas. So um, we would go out and identify, um, you know, things like Mexican hat, blanket flower. We also wanted to identify uh, impervious surfaces, maybe roads that were nearby, because when you go to classify the model, it is going to pick up uh, and identify every pixel that's within the image. So um, thank you for that question. I hope that answered it. Um, looks like there's another one. Um, could the training also be done using a distinctive feature like the seed pods on antelope horns milkweed. Um, I want to divert that one to Ashley because I'm not familiar with that particular type of species. Um, Ashley, would you want to take a stab at that one? Uh, sure. So I guess, um, Brent, I think this, the, this species of milkweed kind of has distinctive shaped milkweed pods. And, and Chris, you can uh, correct me if, if I get this wrong. So in this case, Brent, it would be trying to develop a, well, I can think of maybe two answers. If we have a really distinctive shaped milkweed, we may want to take an approach of using a, the actual image, like recognition, to identify that instead of the spectral signature of that milkweed pod. Um, so maybe you can answer the question or give some information, Brent, on the differences between actually looking at the spectral signature. So here, the question is about the milkweed pod, which would be later in the season. It would be green, you know, turning from green to brown, but it has a unique shape. So could we maybe use image recognition instead of a spectral signature model to help pick out that particular milkweed species? And I would say yes. I, I'm trying to mute in between. Uh, my neighbor is uh, uh, chainsawing down a tree, so uh, I apologize for that. I hope you guys can still hear me okay. Um, so it, yes, that is two different techniques. So one is classification, where you're relying on spectral signature, um, requires you know a a high accuracy um, spatial resolution to really get good results. Um, as you saw in our pr a prior presentation. You know, you can use computer vision to pick up things that have a unique shape. I think, um, you know, various types of, of milkweed, I think, are beneficial for that, right? Because it, it does have a unique um, uh, shape and pod to it. And so um, both techniques, you know, that is something that we discussed early in our research that we wanted to eventually build a computer vision model to, to test the same approach. And, as you guys um, saw from the prior uh, presentation, it, it, you know, you are very capable of, of doing that. So um, one thing we wanted to look at was, um, you know, the, the professor prior had mentioned that um, you could use this type of technology, the camera that they put on top of a car, you could use that on a drone to actually pick it up. So um, there are a few different ways to pick up different types of, of milkweed. You know, I guess my question is, you know, what what ends up being the best to make it a very scalable approach, right? When we when we think about utility corridors and and transportation corridors, 
they're long and go on for hundreds of miles, right? So, um, you know, we want to try and come up with a solution that is scalable and you can you can scan, you know, thousands of acres um, and combining in with what the Arizona DOT showed as well, right? So um, how can you take a, a, um, a predictability model uh, and, and, you know, validate with some results using UAV or other ground-based sensors to really get a comprehensive uh, model. So I, I think this was this was really great. Um, thank you guys so much for inviting me. Um, were there any other questions? Let's see. I think that is it. I think there was one more branch on um, the spatial resolution. How coarse of a spatial resolution do you think would still be effective? Yeah, how it's- many images to cover an acre? I, I hate to say this, Mike, but it really depends. Um, it depends on your altitude that you're flying at um, and, and what you'd be able to pick up. Um, you know, uh, typically a good rule of thumb is whatever you're trying to classify, um, you know, you ideally would like to have a couple of pixels um, encompassing that entire object, right? So for a, you know, a milkweed, uh, a milkweed bulb, you know, you'd want to have a couple of pixels that would fall within the shape um, of, of that object to, to really get a good accuracy. But then it really depends on the, the spectral diversity within that shape. So um, yeah, it, it really depends. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't give you a direct answer there for that. It, it depends on what you're looking at and, uh, and a few different variables. Brent, thank you. Thank you so much. If anyone else has any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. And I'm going to transition us. We're maybe running a little behind to kind of going over the breakout sessions. And um, so our breakout sessions are going to be 40 minutes. And at the end of our breakout session, we are going to have a short recap to discuss the research ideas that were generated in each of these breakout sessions. Um, a quick reminder, once you get to your breakout session, if you have any technical difficulties, there's two ways you guys can ask for help. The first is at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little question mark with the ask for help. So you can push that button and someone will come into your session um, that's out in the larger room to try to help you. You can also actually push the blue button that says leave your breakout room if you leave your breakout room, you'll be taken to the outside room, which there will be people there that can also help you. So yeah, we had a really great discussion in um, our breakout. And so we don't have a lot of time left for kind of the big breakout um, and getting kind of the key takeaways from all the different sessions. But um, what I thought we could do is I told my group that I would start us off in the recap and kind of hit some of the highlights from our discussion. And maybe while I'm kind of walking us through the first um, or the results from our session, everyone else can maybe be adding their comments and highlights from their session on um, the, jam the recap Jamboard. So, uh, okay, there we go. So thank you for sharing that um, group summary. So maybe can I ask the other breakout leaders while our group's kind of verbally giving ours, if you guys could start kind of adding your top research needs that were identified from your session. So from our session, um, a theme that kept coming up a lot was identifying milkweeds and rights of way. So we did talk about the use of cameras, the use of satellites, the use of drones to help, um, help identify where those milkweeds are. Um, we also talked a little bit about um, the best management strategies, mowing, timing, not only for monarchs, but thinking about um, nectar resources in general for other species and making sure we have a good balance on that um, management, not just for the monarch butterfly. Costs came up, thinking about kind of seed mixes, um, the cost of milkweed and establishing um, maybe seedlings on the right of way and making sure that that the cost of that installation is, is going to be successful in the end. Um, 
I'm going to call on my panel, my panel, my fellow panelists to help me fill in any gaps here I'm forgetting from our session. Oh, one of the other things that came up were, was just better kind of real time data for tracking monarch butterflies um, as, as, they, as they move through um, and helping make management, management decisions if we had better data of, of the monarchs as, as they're moving through in the summer. Yeah, Ashley, um, we, we also yeah. talked about, um, I mean, a lot about identifying milkweed, but but how are we identifying it for our crews that are boots on the ground identifying it? So maybe we need to have a fact sheet uh, to help the crews identify the various milkweed plants. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm seeing some other comments that are have come up and I will start some of those that looks like are, are our comments. Are there any other breakout leaders that would like to verbally give a highlight? And that will give me some time to read, read through some of these notes and then I can circle back. Any other, any other sure. breakout leaders want to? Yes, go ahead. Hey, Ashley, Brent, Brent Sloan here. Yeah, um, hey. yeah I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we covered. Um, you know, some of the things you highlighted, we, we, we covered as well. Um, you know, I think that there's, uh, we had a lot of folks from DOT in our group and, you know, overall there's, there's a desire to really help and manage for, uh, for pollinators in general, <clears throat> but the biggest problem is, is funding, right? Um, and there's no real support for it, right? So it almost becomes a political issue where it's, you know, funding typically isn't given to certain entities unless there's some sort of benefit or return on investment that comes out of it, right? So, um, you know, I think there was a real desire to say, hey, you know, there, I know some areas that I have, um, you know, quality pollinator habitat, but I just don't have the man resources or the technology to get out and do it. So, you know, one of the things that we talked about was a lot about like um, barriers, issues that currently exist today. We know that downstream, or at least we hope that there's going to be some technology to kind of bridge that gap. So it's, you know, identifying everything that we're up against today. And then, you know, starting to think about ways that we can we can progress forward and enable some of this technology to help out. Right. So if we yeah. did have something that was large and scalable to be able to, you know, identify where, you know, a majority of quality habitat is, it would allow us to focus, uh, you know, on those hotspot areas and and, um, you know, maybe improve the quality that way. Yep. That was um, that was actually one of the points that came up in our session too was being able to uh, prioritize habitat for protection. So that was that was a topic in our session as well. So I see a couple other um, uh, a couple other notes here. Um, one for Arizona about Forbes only flowering at certain times of the year, limiting mapping yeah. opportunities. Okay. Yes. Yeah. This is Tim. Mean? Group yes, four, yeah. we talked a lot Group about four, the monitoring. Please. Yes, okay. and um, there's all great ideas, um, but in that one particular sticky note is finding that opportunity to do it, especially out west. Yep. If you have drought in a particular mm -hmm. year or a fire or something, you missed it, or gr cattle grazing can be a problem. It doesn't mean the forbs or the milkweed is not there, though. In the case of cattle, maybe it it, it still is, but um, you could miss that chance. And um, you know, how do we get around that? And I added another one um, oh, it's related to Tyler's research. You know, we're really intrigued by the mowing schedules, but finding a way to balance mm -hmm. Forbes versus um, the milkweed, you know, other Forbes. Yep. That, yep. you know, we don't want to ignore the nectar sources. Yep. And yeah, that that came up in our, in our session too. Yep. One last one I'll add it. Um, we might think it's, it's a joke, but um, if we're really successful in our management practices along roadways and get a lot of milkweed growing, is there a net benefit to the butterfly populations? In other words, what about that quote unquote incidental take of vehicle collisions? I mean, it, I don't know how you do that, but um, it seemed like a valid question. I, I, you have to think it'll come up at some point in time. Yep. Thank you. And Tim. a lot of these uh, similar themes came up in our discussion too. I think another one was um addressing um weed seed banks ahead of revegetation yeah 
Yep. Uh, Good one. Yeah. So, and kind of translating construction specifications for revegetation into maintenance practices where there's usually less funding and not as much technology for, um, for doing the revegetation. So, yeah. So Thank I kind of, I put yeah, these blue ones in and okay. I kind of tried to line okay. them up with the others. Thank you. So, yeah. And I, I think, thank you for all everyone that's putting on, putting in notes. I'm having a hard time trying to read all these notes as they're coming in. So I'm kind of think I'm failing on facilitating. So is there anyone else that can verbally uh, speak to speak to the notes, a uh, note that they put up or um, any of the, any of the other discussion leaders have anything else to add? Ashley, one thing that did come up in our group was uh, the safety concerns on the highway right of ways um, in the distances that are required to be mowed. Uh, we talked about that a little bit and we talked about possibly putting together a survey uh, that could go out to, to the DOTs across North America to see what everybody else is doing so that, you know, some folks that don't know how to adjust their programs can see and have contacts um, with other DOTs to help uh, alleviate maybe some of that and, yep. and uh, decide what these clear zones really should be. Um, yep. You know, and everybody, everybody's been talking about cost as well in, in how to get something in the program and make it work. I suspect that most everybody has a sustainability group and that may be a real target for everybody to, to go to your sustainability group and ask the question about your, does your company have a goal towards a sustainability ESG target? And can this be brought into that target? And if it can, then all of a sudden you may find money that's available to go into these programs to help manage this pollinator or monarch habitat. Yeah, that's a really good point, Lou. That was actually a comment in our, our, in our discussion on a barrier and can we leverage or develop metrics for ESG reporting? So that's a really good point on um, or maybe overcoming a funding barrier or a potential research of developing these metrics that can be leveraged in sustainability reporting. A real quick point to add to that too is um, we had a good conversation about having language in policy and uh, for contractors or for contracting that reflects back all this information. Um, you know, because some of us that work in in um, the maintenance side of things, you know, we can have all the conversations we want to about doing better practices, but we need that policy in the background, you know, as a hard stop to make sure that people are going to follow it, you know, if we're not able to talk to them um, and make it more of a, of a definitive practice that has to happen. Yep. And that goes... That goes right along with with making sure that you're developing a, a very system wide long range vegetation plan and program, you know, because not only our roads, but our utility poles and wires are built to last a very long time. So our vegetation program should be built to last a pretty decent amount of time as well. And in there, you can develop your your goals and your your procedures and, and, and put a lot of those targets in there. And then once your company accepts that long range plan, then it's easy to pull from there for your contracts. We have a question in the chat about kind of more questions concerning monarchs and habitat. What's the way um, to reach out? Oh, Caroline just put an answer in. So thank you, Caroline. Uh, we have a discussion board. Um, at the website. I think you can also reach out to any of the coordinators of this of this call today and we'll try to help get your answer, answer your questions on this topic. Are there any other breakout leaders that haven't had a chance? We only have a couple minutes left, but anyone else want to jump in here? Um, one of the research ideas that came up in our group was um, related to the difficulties in prioritizing where to mow. And um, if there could be research about um, evaluating those trade-offs of um, the mowing timing, and then also how to set your mowing schedule, your mowing windows. Okay. So. All right, we will um, get we'll get that. Hopefully, again, can get we'll get that captured on our in our summary and. Um, 
Thank you, everyone, for this really. Ashley, yeah, real, go ahead. Ashley, yeah. Real quick, yeah. this is Tim. You know, talk yeah. about timing and mowing. We were talking about herbicides, and, and Lou got me to thinking about it. If there's some research, I mean, you know that a lot of the utilities, electric utilities, herbicides is the go-to woody vegetation mm -hmm. management technique. Um, can the seed bank recover from that if you're only spraying every th four, five, six years? And then I got to thinking, if you do have to use an herbicide, is there a time of the year that you could do that that would have a minimal impact on milkweed versus the woodies? Um, yep. The woodies theoretically will be there all the yep. time, whereas a lot of your forbs and stuff, you, you know, yep. the growing season. So I'm wondering if the timing um, principle could yep. apply to that. So thanks. I think, Sorry. I, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question, Tim, and I think there would be windows um, where we could minimize impacts to, um, to milkweed. So really, really good comment. And actually, I'm not sure it came up a couple of times, but I just put a link in the chat to a, a web page for a project of Tim Acres of, of Habitat Restoration, where are dividing the, the restoration area into four different site preparation, whether it's burned or dist or herbicided, um, to okay. see what works best. Um, and so if we're interested, they can look at that. But it's just, just okay. right now. So. Oh, excellent. Is, it, is this at Kansas? Yeah. Kansas, okay, Kansas Biological Survey, Kansas Correct. State, University of Kansas, okay. University of Kansas. Kansas. University of Kansas. Okay. Okay, we have one minute left. Um, Iris, thank you everyone for all these great comments um, and discussion. I really appreciate everyone's participation. And Iris, I will turn it over to you so you can um, conclude our webinar for today. Okay, yep, and I'll just echo um, Ashley's remarks there. Thank you everyone uh, for sticking around um, here to the end. And it sounds like there were some really good productive discussions and ideas that were generated uh, as part of the webinar today. So appreciate your engagement and interest. Uh, and again, uh, your involvement and in, in helping to move the needle on um, some of these discussions. So we do have one more webinar um, in this webinar series, our research roundtable webinar series uh, coming up in November. Uh, the date is to be determined, but will be in the first half of November likely. Um, and we are going to be focusing on uh, solar power and pollinators. So co-locating uh, pollinator habitat or pollinator plantings at solar facilities. Um, and we're working on lining up some uh, really interesting research projects uh, on that topic. So encourage you uh, to join us then as well. Um, and as has been mentioned, we will be posting the slides and a recording of today's webinar um, onto the Rights of Way Habitat Working Group website. And we'll send out an email with all of that information as well as the attendee list um, probably next week. So stay tuned uh, to that. And thank you again, uh, everyone for your participation today.